we left off last night after the five hindrances with entering the first jhana. So tonight I want to talk about the four jhanas. The, uh, I'll just continue with the same sutta, the Samanyapala Sutta, which is number two in the long discourses. Quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining and is filled with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. One drenches deep, saturates and suffuses one's body with this rapture and happiness born of seclusion. So there is no part of one's entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. Okay, so as I said last night, the secluded from sense desire, secluded from unwholesome states is the seclusion from the hindrances. And the, our method of becoming secluded from the hindrances is generating access concentration. Once access concentration is generated, you're not getting distracted and yeah, hindrances are just distractions. You probably could use one of the hindrances as a label for almost any distraction that comes up, but certainly don't feel you have to. Then it says one enters and dwells in the first jhana. So the jhana arises and you sustain it, which is accompanied by the words are vitaka and vichara, which literally mean something like thinking and examining or thinking and pondering. Unfortunately, in the Abhidhamma and the commentaries, they started finding states that were more deeply concentrated than what the Buddha was describing in the suttas. And in the first jhana, there was no room for thinking and examining. So rather than realizing, oh, uh, we're doing something wrong here, they just simply changed the definition of the words. They changed it to initial and sustained attention to the meditation object, which it's true, you do have to have that. I mean, you have to have that to get to access concentration. You've got to put your attention on your meditation object, the breath, and you've got to sustain your attention on your meditation object. And you actually have to have them for all of the jhanas put it on the pleasant sensation and sustain your attention on the pleasant sensation. When the jhana arises, you put your attention on the PT Sukha experience and sustain your attention on it. So thinking and examining would be a much better translation. Though Pali has what's called well, a somatic repetition in order to emphasize something, you say it using similar words. So thinking and more thinking is really what's going on here. And it's filled with piti and sukha, born of seclusion. So the piti arises from the fact that you're not being assailed by the hindrances. Your mind has gotten quiet enough and the PT can arise. The PT will arise on its own without you doing anything if you stay in access concentration long enough. But I've given you a shortcut, which is eventually to shift your attention to a pleasant sensation. And the pleasant sensation will set up that positive feedback loop such that the PT arises. As I mentioned, the common translation of PT is rapture but also I see euphoria, ecstasy, delight, and my favorite is glee. And sukha, the opposite of dukkha, would be joy or happiness. So basically, you've got the hindrances under control, and the piti and sukha arise, and you enter and sustain that state. You enter that state and sustain your attention on the piti and sukha, and the piti and sukha sustained. And don't worry about the background thinking. Okay. It's still there. The background thinking, remember in the access concentration where thoughts were wispy and in the background. 
Well, that can continue to happen in the first jhana. Then it says, one drenches steep, saturates and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion. So there is no part of one's entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. Again, we have this repetition, drench, steep, saturate, and suffuse. It's not four different things to do. It's just emphasis. The first jhana, often the experience of PT is the upper body, maybe the upper torso, neck, head, maybe the whole spine. It may not be fully encompassing the body. That's fine at first. The first thing to do is to get in the first time. The second thing to do is to get in the second time and then to get in repeatedly. And once you are able to get in and sustain being in, okay, now you've got some skill with it. It's then possible to move the PT and Sukha throughout your body. So what you would do, let's say the PT is not in your arm. Put your attention where the PT is, head, face, whatever. And just move your attention down your arm. You're not trying to move the PT and Sukha. You're just moving your attention. You don't know how to move the PT and Sukha, but you do know how to move your attention. And so the PT and Sukha will follow along. Quite interesting. Settle in again. Now put your attention back on where it's strong and move it down the other arm. And do the same for the lower part of the torso and each of your legs. And it will feel like the PT and Sukha spreads out. But remember, this is an advanced practice. You don't have to do this the first few times you get in. Just getting in is good enough. You want to get in and get good at getting in and getting stable. And then you can try spreading it. We have a simile for each of these jhanas. And for the first one, Suppose a skilled bath attendant or his apprentice were to pour soap flakes into a metal basin, sprinkle them with water, and knead them into a ball so that the ball of soap flakes would be pervaded by moisture, encompassed by moisture, suffused with moisture inside and out, and yet would not trickle. In the same way, one drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion. So there is no part of one's entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. So we get a picture of what soap was like at the time of the Buddha. You didn't go to the Safeway and buy a bar of soap. You've got your skilled bath attendant or his apprentice to take a metal basin and pour in just the right amount of soap flakes and then pour in just the right amount of water and then mix the soap flakes and water until they were so thoroughly mixed, you had a homogeneous ball of soap. This is, this is like the first jhana. The PT of the first jhana is, well, rather intense. It's uh, kind of frenetic, like the mixing of the soap flakes in the water. And the soap flakes are to be totally pervaded by the water which is what you do when you do the drench, steep, saturate, and suffuse. So yeah, it's a good simile. When you get into the first jhana, probably 10 minutes is a maximum time you'd want to spend there. Somewhere between five and 10 minutes, but only if the PT is mild. If the PT is really intense, don't stay very long. Generally, I'm in the first jhana for somewhere around 10 seconds. You know, I know how to bring it up really strong and hang out there. All right, I've had enough. Take a deep breath and move on to the next. So if you're getting super intense PT, move on. When it starts to get to be too much, when it starts to get to be too much, move on. And the way to move on is just take a deep breath. And when you let the energy out, just on the exhale, let the energy out and the PT will calm down and take you towards the second jhana. Further, with the subsiding of thinking and examining, one enters and dwells in the second jhana, 
which is accompanied by inner tranquility and unification of mind, is without thinking and examining, and is filled with the rapture and happiness born of concentration. One drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration. So there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by this rapture and happiness. So with the subsiding of thinking and examining, what's hopefully happening is you're in the first jhana and yeah, the thinking and examining just slides away, but that's probably not what's going to really happen. Particularly if the PT is really intense, you probably don't want to stick around that long. So the trick is when you've had enough of the first jhana, take a deep breath, let the energy out and let things settle. In the first jhana, the PT is in the foreground and the sukha is in the background. And now when you take the breath, they both decrease, but the PT decreases more and the sukha is more prominent now, right? So you're doing a foreground background shift. And now your focus is on the emotional sense of joy, happiness, however it's there. The PT, instead of being perhaps heat or vibration, is now maybe you're finding yourself rocking a bit, or maybe there's some swaying, maybe there's circles. So there's still some movement there, but it's not the same as it was in the first jhana. It's not intense at all. And it's in the background. What's in the foreground is the emotional state of joy and happiness. And that is now your object. So unlike focusing on the breath, which is physical, or the PT in the first jhana, which is physical, or even the pleasant sensation before the first jhana, which is physical, you're now focused on something that's entirely mental, the emotion. Maybe it's not entirely mental. Maybe the emotion has a physical component to it, but you're focused on an emotion rather than a pure physical feeling. It's again says that, that it's filled with rapture and happiness born of concentration. The concentration of the first jhana has given you enough concentration to get to the second jhana. Access concentration, the abandoning of the hindrances, secluded from the hindrances, got you to the first jhana. Now, using the intensity of the first jhana to go to the second. The concentration of the first jhana makes it possible to enter and dwell in the second jhana. Once again, uh, there you drench, deep, saturate, and suffuse your body with a rapture and happiness born of concentration. So there is no part of one's entire body not suffused with this rapture and happiness. It's the same thing. Most people find that the transition from the first jhana to the second jhana involves a physical sense of going down. And the center of the experience drops more from, say, head, face, neck area down into the heart center. Although that can be idiosyncratic and can differ from person to person. But that's generally what people say. But again, it may not completely pervade your body. Okay, so first you want to get in, and then you want to get in a second time, and you want to get good at sustaining the second jhana. And after you get good at sustaining it, then you can spread it. And it's the same thing. Put your attention, say, at the heart center, if that feels like the center of it. And again, move your attention down your arm, and then down the other arm. And the sense of happiness will Spread along with your attention. Again, you're not trying to move the happiness. You're only moving your attention. We have a simile. Suppose there were a deep lake whose waters welled up from below. It would have no inlet for water from the east, west, north, or south, nor would it be refilled from time to time with showers of rain. Yet a current of cool water welling up from within the lake would drench deep, saturate, and suffuse the whole lake 
So there would be no part of that entire lake which is not suffused with the cool water. In the same way, one drench is deep, saturates and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration so that there is no part of one's entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. Okay, so the picture is a lake far up in the mountains, no rain showers, no streams, but a spring at the bottom of the lake. And the spring water comes up and completely permeates the lake, completely fills the lake. This is an amazingly accurate depiction of what the second jhana feels like. It, it feels like there's this wellspring of happiness in your heart center. And this happiness is just overflowing, is just coming up in a spring. It's really quite striking how well it captures it. I learned the second jhana from Ayakema, but at that retreat, she didn't mention these similes. And then a year later, I'm on retreat with her and she reads out the similes and I'm just blown away. After she finishes her talk and she's walking back to where she's staying, I go running after her. I came, I came, it's just like that. It's just like that. And she laughed and said, yeah, it's just like that. It's a really brilliant simile. For the second and higher jhanas, you want to learn to stay in them for an extended period of time. I say, learn to stay in for 10 to 15 minutes. As you get skilled enough, yeah, then maybe you're only staying for five to 10 minutes as you move through. But at first, yeah, get good at it. Find it, stabilize it, stay with it. And the object for the second jhana is the sukha, the joy, happiness feeling. So after you've been there long enough, then you can move on to the third jhana. Further, with the fading away of rapture, one dwells in equanimity, mindful and clearly comprehending, and experiences happiness with the body. Thus one enters and dwells in the third jhana of which the noble ones declare, one dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness. One drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with this happiness free from rapture, so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by this happiness. Okay, by definition, the rapture goes away with the fading away of rapture. The piti is gone. It predominates in the first, it's in the background in the second, and in the third, it's just completely gone. The way to get the PT to calm down is, again, you can use your breath. Take a breath in, and with the exhale, turn down the volume of the happiness to contentment. The, the happiness maybe is giving you a big grin, you know, right? Pretty happy, all right? You turn the volume down to contentment, and now you've just got a little Buddha smile. The, uh, the first jhana, you might have a big grin with your teeth showing. The second jhana, big grin, no teeth. Third jhana, Buddha smile. And your target is contentment, wishlessness, satisfaction. Satisfaction so complete that if Mick Jagger had been practicing the third jhana, he wouldn't be able to sing that song. Right? You are satisfied. To help you find that feeling of contentment, of satisfaction, as you start to exhale and turn down the volume on the happiness, it might be helpful to remember a time when you were very contented. Something like, you just eaten the perfect meal, you didn't overeat, and you don't have to wash the dishes. It's just that feeling of, ah, yeah. So you start turning down the happiness as you exhale, you grab the memory like for a quarter of a second and pluck the feeling of contentment out of it. And now that descending happiness becomes that contentment and you focus on it. You focus on it and then it gets steady. And now you're focused on contentment. And the PT's all gone, it's very still. 
Remember in the second, I said you might be rocking or swaying or something like that. In the third jhana, it's very still because all the PT has gone. And you're just contented. You're just happy to be there, wishless. Again, it's a sense of things going down, dropping maybe from the heart center to the belly for the center of it. And again, if you want to spread it, because one drink of steep saturates and suffuses the body with the happiness free from PT, put your attention where the happiness seems strong and move it to the other parts of the body. And the happiness will follow along. The contentment will follow along. The sense of things going down as the numbers go up continues through all of the first four jhanas. Your energy level is going down and that seems to make the sense of the jhana going down as well. In fact, the down is so strong that if a student in an interview says they went down, I don't know if they went down numerically or they went down physically. So you're in two and you go down. I don't know whether that means you went back to one because the number went down or you went on to three because the feeling goes down. I was once doing some meditation in an fMRI machine for science and they wanted to tell me when to shift the jhanas. And they said, we'll tell you to go up and down. And I was like, no, 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 no. Up and down is not going to work. You're going to be saying... Number, numerical up and down, and I'm going to be thinking physical up and down, and it ain't going to work. You have to say previous and next, and that worked just fine. But that's how strong the feeling of down is as you go through the first four jhanas. We have a simile. Suppose in a lotus pond, there were blue, white, or red lotuses that had been born in the water, grow in the water, but never rise up above the water, but flourish immersed in the water. From their tips to their roots, they would be drenched, deep, saturated, and suffused with the water, so there would be no part of those lotuses not suffused with the water. In the same way, one drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the happiness free from rapture, so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused with happiness. So we have a lotus pond and lotuses coming up out of the mud, but not above the surface of the water. They're not waving in the breeze. They're not bobbing up and down. They're underwater and they're completely permeated with water. This is, this is very good too, because by the time you get to the third jhana, you feel like you've withdrawn more from the outside world. You've just gotten so quiet that everything is turned inward and you're a bit more isolated from the outside world, which is the feeling you get if you were, say, underwater just a bit. Again, you want to stay 10 to 15 minutes when you're learning it. You want to get good at it before you try and spread it. And then when you're ready and have a good third jhana, Further, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous passing away of joy and grief, one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasant nor painful and contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. One sits suffusing one's body with a pure, bright mind, so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by a pure, bright mind. So fourth jhana abandoning of pleasure and pain. There, there's no pain in the jhanas, but there's certainly pleasure. There's piti in the first two and the sukha in the, in the first three. And then with the previous passing away of joy and grief, no grief in the jhanas, but joy in the first two. So what you're aiming for is a place that's emotionally neutral. So you're sitting there being very contented. Being contented is a pleasant mind state. Like I said, you might have a little wispy Buddha smile there. 
what you want to do to move to the fourth jhana is let go of the pleasure of the third jhana. I find I can put my attention in that little wispy Buddha smile and relax all the muscles in my face. And when I do, there's a sense of things starting to drop down. That banishing of pleasure often gives way to a sense of things dropping down. Go with the dropping down. Just let it drop as far as it will go. It may drop for several minutes. Okay, just ride it on down. When it settles, your focus is on quiet stillness. Fourth jhana is often called the jhana of equanimity. But if I tell you focus on equanimity, that's probably a little bit nebulous. But if I tell you focus on quiet stillness, you know what that is. And if you focus on quiet stillness, you will be focused on equanimity. So the fourth jhana is an emotionally neutral place, neither painful nor pleasant, neither sukha nor dukkha. And it contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. This is how you go and get the best kind of mindfulness, one that's fully purified by equanimity. It says one sits suffusing one's body with a pure, bright mind. So there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by a pure, bright mind. When I first learned the fourth jhana, it was dark. And again, it was like a year before I came a, on another retreat, read out this bit about the pure, bright mind. Well, pure, I could see that because my mind was so quiet. It was definitely pure, but bright. I mean, it was dark. What's the bright about? There's a simile. Suppose a man were to be sitting covered from the head down by a white cloth, so there would be no part of his entire body not suffused by the white cloth. In the same way, one sits suffusing one's body with the pure, bright mind, so there would be no part of one's entire body not suffused by a pure, bright mind. Well, it's dark. Why, why is it a white cloth? Why not a black cloth? I mean, the picture is pretty clear. There's a guy with a sheet over him, just completely covering him. The sense of isolation that that gives, yes, that fits very well. But why bright? Why white? So I went to see how you came at my interview and asked her about it. She said, describe the fourth jhana, and I did. She said, yeah, that's fine. Just keep doing that. Okay. So I had to put it in the I don't know bucket for 16 years. And then I went on a retreat with Venerable Pawak. Now, Pawak is a jhana master from Southern Burma who teaches the Sudhimaga jhanas really deep states of concentration. In order to get to the Vasudhi Maga jhanas, you've got to generate a nimitta, a circle of light. And the way you generate that circle of light is you get into what I'm calling access concentration and stay there for three or four hours. At the start of the retreat, Powell gave us the, the counting count up to eight and the gap between the out and the in. If you get to eight, start at one. If you get lost, start at one. And he said, when you can do that for 30 minutes without getting lost, let me know. So my next interview, yeah, after I could do that, I said, yeah, I can do that. And he says, good, drop the counting and continue to follow your breath for the next three or four hours. I'm like, three or four hours? That's a long sit. So I decided I would sit in my room because I knew that my body was going to give out after about an hour and three quarters to two hours. So I would sit in my room in a chair next to my bed. And when my body just didn't like sitting in a chair anymore, I'd slide over into the bed for 15, 20 minutes, following my breath the whole time, and then slide back into the chair for the rest of it. And I could go for three or four hours. But after I started doing that, it wasn't long before I'd been in access for an hour or more. And suddenly I would get this violent PT. I mean, I was shaking really so much. I was afraid my head was going to pop off. It only lasted maybe 10, 15 seconds, and then it would die down. It happened several times. So I go to see Powell for my next interview. 
And I describe it. I didn't use the word PT. I just described the shaking and so forth. And he says to me, that is gross PT. Do not let that happen. Oh, okay. Don't let that happen. Well, you know, I learned a long time ago, it's good to smile when I meditate because that brings on the PT. So what if I don't smile? Yeah, don't, don't think a happy thought. I just keep a nice solemn expression on my face. And if I did that, I could keep the PT at bay and I could do the half hour of counting. I had a little timer and set it for half an hour. And when it went off, you know, quit counting and keep meditating. I wasn't getting as nimitta though, but I was getting really, really concentrated. And then sometimes, you know, I'd done what he told me to do. I meditated for four hours and now I'm going to smile. And I would get that really strong PG. And then it would go away. And I would find myself in what I recognized to be the second jhana. I had this break your face grin on my face and I was so happy and the state was incredibly stable. My mind was not going anywhere. I could even look around and examine, okay, what's going on here? Yeah, this is second jhana and just, I mean, very stable and very happy. So after I'd been in it a little while, it was like, wow, wonder what third John is like. I couldn't get there. I, I'd try and take a breath and calm things down and the PT would come back. Hey, all right, I'm stuck in second John. It's not a terrible place to be stuck, but okay. After about, I don't know, 15 minutes, there was this sense of things just sort of going over the edge and dropping down. And the uh, the happiness, the break your face grin went away and it just converted into contentment. Wispy Buddha smile, no more PT coming. Very stable, really not going anywhere. This was very satisfying. Hang out there. Okay, five minutes. What's the fourth jhana like? I couldn't wipe the smile off my face. I'd put my attention in it, I'd take a breath, I'd let the smile go and immediately come back. Now I'm stuck in the third jhana. Well, not a bad place to be stuck. Just hang out there for a while. And then eventually there was a sense of things going over the edge and dropping down. And when they dropped this time, they dropped for quite a while and then they settled. And I was in the fourth jhana. Only my visual field was bright white. It was, well, it was like sitting in an open field on a bright sunny day with a white sheet over my head and my eyes open. Oh yeah, just like the simile. And now I understood what the bright white was all about. Clearly the level of concentration I was experiencing when I was in the fourth jhana before was not the same level as what's described in the suttas. But by spending three to four hours in access, I was getting a level of concentration that was giving me the bright white in the fourth jhana. And it was repeatable. I was able to do that, do what Powell told me to do. Okay, my four hours are up, you know, smile. Violent PT, stable second, stable third, stable fourth, bright white. Clearly the Buddha and his monks were more concentrated than I had been before, which makes sense. I mean, you know, they probably weren't doing 45 minute sit, 45 minute walk. These were people that could sit cross-legged for a whole day. They would eat the midday meal, which was probably 10 or 11 o'clock, and then they would go for the day's abiding. So they'd have six, seven hours, just one long sit. Yeah, they get super concentrated. And when they went into the jhanas, it was much more concentrated than I was getting with my five or 10 minutes of access concentration. On retreats after that, I did play with say, going into access for an hour and I could also get the bright white 
by doing that. I didn't need the three or four hours, but I did need more than the five or 10 minutes I was used to doing in order to get the bright white. One of the things that Ayakema said about the third and fourth jhana, third jhana, it's like you're sitting in the mouth of a well. You're a bit isolated from the world around you. To get to the fourth jhana requires more letting go than you've had to do before. So let go and drop down the well. Now the dropping down is more of a drifting down rather than a free fall or something like that. It's like drifting down to the bottom of a swimming pool or something like that, or you know, going down underwater. We can also think of it as you're in the mouth of a cave in the third jhana. In the fourth jhana, you go deep into the cave, but the cave goes down as you get deep into it. So there's this sense of going deeper, down deeper, quieter, etc. And as Ayakema said, it requires more letting go. You might be wondering, letting go of what? Well, letting go of anything you're hanging on to. Just let go completely into the experience. But the most important thing, let go of the pleasure of the contentment. Let that go to get things started and just let go into the sinking down experience until it comes to rest and you can focus on quiet stillness. So that's the first four jhanas, sutta jhanas. You might be wondering, okay, so what's the point? Well, when one's mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs and inclines it to knowing and seeing. One understands thus, this is my body having material form, composed of the four primary elements, originating from mother and father, built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing, to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness, supported by it and bound up with it. The purpose of the jhanas is to generate a mind that's concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, which you can direct and incline to knowing and seeing. Generate a mind that is best suited for insight practice. So the whole idea of the jhanas is you get your mind concentrated, jhanically concentrated, and then in the same sitting, you come out of the highest jhana you know, and start doing some insight practice. You could do standard Vipassana, whatever that means to you. You could do the five daily recollections, which we talked about. We're gonna do a number of other insight practices, all of which are suitable for doing post jhana. But in particular, it says, one understands thus, this is my body, having material form composed of the four primary elements originating from mother and father, built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness supported by it and bound up with it. So the knowing and seeing the insight practices is an investigation of body and consciousness. Well, consciousness here is being used synonymously with mind. So an investigation of body and mind. If you think back to this morning, to the Satipatthana Sutta, the four establishments of mindfulness. The first one is body. The second one is Vedana. That's part of mind. The third one is mind states. Definitely mind. And the fourth one is phenomena, and most of those phenomena are mental phenomena, except for the ones that are physical. So mind and body in the fourth one. The purpose of the jhanas is a warm-up exercise for insight practice, and the Satipatthana Sutta contains 13 insight practices that are suitable for doing post-jhana. 
the jhanas are like sharpening your mind. Say you had a wooden two by four and you wanted to cut it in two and all you had was a butter knife. Oh, that's going to be hard, right? You can grab that butter knife and start going. You make a little dent right away, but, you know, cutting a two by four in two with a butter knife is going to be a really difficult task. But if you had a whetstone and put an edge on that butter knife, made it sharp, you could cut a lot faster. You'd make up for all the time you wasted with the sharpening. It'd get dull, you'd have to sharpen it again, but you could indeed cut a two by four into with a butter knife, provided you sharpened it up. I'm guessing that full awakening, total enlightenment, is probably more difficult than cutting a two by four into with a butter knife. You're gonna need a sharp mind to do this. This is what the jhanas are all about. In the Tibetan tradition, there is Manjushri, who holds a sword. He's the bodhisattva of wisdom and he uses his sword to cut through the bonds of ignorance. Jhana practice is just sharpening Manjushri's sword. You haven't cut any bonds of ignorance yet. You gotta go out and wield the sword. That's your insight practice. And you certainly don't wanna make the mistake of just sharpening, just doing jhana practice. You know, if you just do jhana practice, eventually, <laughs> You're not going to have any sword left. You're just going to sharpen it into oblivion. So sharpen your mind and then go investigate reality. The jhanas are a skill best suited to people that have good concentration skills. And a uh, lifestyle and life setting that enables them to do that. But that's not everybody. The jhanas are, yeah, a very useful tool for those who can use them. But there are other people who have other skills and you use the skills you have. And depending on your life circumstances, jhanas might be available. They might not be available. But you can try it out and see. And yeah, all four jhanas in one go, yeah, that's a lot of information. Uh, but we, hey, we only got 10 days. So, you know, I got to give you a lot of information every night. And there's not much, I mean, if I just gave you one, I did that already. Have an idea of where you're heading for. You get a sense of all of this, but don't think you're going to get there all at once. You're going to play with what's happening and you'll see what shows up and work with it and then maybe something else will happen after that. And I'd say don't sweat it. After leaving retreat, going back to your quote unquote normal life, how, what type of commitment does it normally take to keep that skill uh, going? Right. There's, there's two things you need. One is to know what you're doing, to have marked out your path. You know, you, you know, okay, this is how I generate access concentration. Here's my pleasant sensation. This doing that brings on the first jhana. Here's how I transition. So you just, you have a good idea. It's, it's not stumbling. It's, it's, it's become marked out for you. You know what to do. And the second thing is how good is your daily practice? Ayakema said that if you want to keep the jhanas indefinitely, keep the same level of concentration you have on a retreat, you need to sit for an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. Otherwise, yeah, they're going to fade out. And how quickly they fade out is going to depend on, well, how close to an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening you get. Now, me telling you about the hour in the morning, hour in the evening, is me telling you what Ayakema told me, not me telling you what I do or what I ever manage to do on a regular basis. It's hard. There's so much else going on in our lives. It's hard to carve out both an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. 
this is why it's good to be a monastic. Yeah, your schedule's set up, so you've got an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening, right? But as lay people, it's more difficult. About the best I could do was an hour in the morning, and then some evenings there was a sitting group I could attend. And so that gave me another, yeah, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. And yeah, that was helpful. But even say nine sittings a week, yeah, it'd start fading out, not real fast, but they, they'd fade down until after about a year, yeah, I was having trouble getting all the jhanas that I knew. I mean, sometimes, yeah, a couple weeks would go by and I wouldn't get hardly anything. Come home from the retreat. Uh, yeah, I got all the jhanas I knew on that retreat. But after, you know, about a month, I couldn't get to the highest number anymore, at least not at home. Maybe when I got a second sitting in, yeah, I get them all. Uh, after another couple weeks, couldn't get to the next highest or the highest at home. But if I got a second sitting in, yeah, usually they all come back. You know, so it's starting to fade out. Sometimes, you know, no jhanas in the morning. But yeah, if I got that second sitting in, yeah, maybe they'd be back. And it just kept getting harder and harder. And then I go on a retreat again. And yeah, they're back. I mean, I go on a day long. And maybe no John is the first sit. The second sit, yep, they're back. And any other sits during that day, yeah, the Johnners are there. I go on another retreat. It's not a John retreat. Yeah, the Johnners come back real easy. Not a problem. So what does it take? It takes having a, a good understanding of how to enter the jhanas and sustain them. It takes having a good daily practice and it takes going on more retreats, especially when your access to the jhanas begins to fade. Spend about half your time working on concentration and about half your time working on insight. And then all the time working on mindfulness <laughs> But, uh, you know, to the best of your ability, given life circumstances. But that's a general rule, half concentration, half insight. Uh, it may be that, yeah, some sittings you're just working with concentration the whole time. Other sittings you sit down and you could just tell there could be no concentration today. You're just all over the place. So, yeah, you do the best you can with your insight practice at that time. But ideally 50-50. I'm intrigued with this idea of counting for quite a long period of time. And I wonder, and, and even the idea, you know, using the timer to, to, so you don't have to wonder, you know, yeah. how long have I been counting? Because it strikes me that would create more stability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do a long sit, if you can sit for say an hour and a half, then yeah. you can count for half an hour. Right. Uh -huh. If you're sitting for 45 minutes, yeah, don't count for half an hour. Right. No, but if I do, but, you know, we have time during our days. I've been doing longer sits. So, yeah. So you could extend the amount of time you're counting and you just with it. And when their timer goes off, you just quit counting and just stay with the breath and make sure you've got good access before you trigger the jhana. Or just stay with the breath and don't even trigger the jhana and stay longer. You could do, say, 20 minutes of counting and then 20 minutes with no counting and then trigger the jhana. I mean, yeah, that'll you take mean, you in. You mean then focus on the pleasant sensation at that point? Is that what you mean by trigger right. the jhana? Yeah, yeah, trigger the jhana is the name as focus on the pleasant. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, experiment. I mean, you got lots of time. time. You somehow got to fill up those six to eight hours. Yeah, exactly. Sounds like you do have to intentionally decide to move from one state to the next. Yeah, it will move by itself, particularly when you're on a retreat. Uh, I mean, the jhanas are neurotransmitters. I mean, all of your experience is neurotransmitters. And so 
you move into the first jhana and eventually you're going to run out of the neurotransmitters for the first jhana and it's going to move on its own to the second jhana, right? And you, you're going to stay there for a while and eventually they're going to start to run out and you'll move to the third, etc. So it will move on its own. But when you go home, you're not going to be as concentrated and it's less likely to move on its own. So it's good to learn how to move intentionally. Uh, and if it moves on its own before you intend it, yeah, just go with it and let it move on. All right, so you're sitting there in the second jhana and you decide, okay, it's time to go to the third. And so you're taking that breath and you're remembering the contented experience and grabbing the contented feeling. Really from the moment you decide, okay, I'm going to move until it settles on the contented feeling, you're, you're an in-between state. You're not really in the second because it's a little too much mental activity, but you haven't arrived yet in the third either. So yeah, there's a, sort of a recognition time to move and then there's a little doing to move and settling in. I find particularly say going from second to third, there's this intention. So I take the breath, as I exhale, I remember the contented feeling. I pull it out. I focus on the feeling and it takes a few seconds. Oh, there. Yeah, right. So it's not stable at first. The feeling is there, but I'm not stabilized on it. So there's probably five to eight seconds, maybe even 10 seconds where I'm between jhanas. And the same sort of thing for the others as well. When you're in third, and you take the breath to drop down into four, that dropping is part of the transition. And it's not till it settles into the quiet stillness that you're actually in four. But there was that intention, okay, take the deep breath. And just then the intention is stay with the dropping. And when it settles, find the quiet stillness. Would it be correct to say that these first four jhanas, the experiences, all the ways that you've described them, they all seem to have references in sort of normal human experience. It just sounds like they're more sort of concentrated versions of them, but there's nothing in any of these that's like a totally unfamiliar thing. It's just that you don't normally get it in that heavy dose. Right. Yeah. And sometimes you even get it in that heavy dose your team wins the championship and you're just jumping around ecstatic. You've got the same neurotransmitters going on that you get in the first jhana, but it was triggered by something external, not by your concentrated mind. They're, they were usually referred to as the rupa jhanas, material jhanas. And part of that is because these are experiences we have in the material world. The other four jhanas are the arupa jhanas, the immaterial jhanas, and they're not like anything we've ever experienced in the material world. We'll get to those in, what, two nights. I am concerned about doing this practice in the evening because of triggering uh, too much PT, Suka. Yeah, yeah. Me manic episode. Right. A lot of people find that they shouldn't play with the jhanas after supper. You know, it's just a little too much because the PT can definitely give you insomnia. You get a big hit of PT off the evening meta you might not get to sleep for hours. And this is common. People who stumble into the first jhana eventually after the evening metta, yep, they're gonna be short on sleep that night. So yeah, if you're concerned at all about you know, too much energy keeping you awake, then yeah, don't do the jhana practice after supper, do some other practice whatever your standard Vipassana is, or just do some metta or, you know, 
any, any practice will do as long as it doesn't bring on the PT. And this is a common thing that happens that people get too much PT too close to bedtime and it keeps them awake. So your Pawak experience, uh, so you talked about the fourth jhana being very white and bright. Were the first three also? Not strikingly like the fourth was. They were just the usual dark. The, the visual field in the jhanas for most people is dark unless their concentration is extremely good and then it might get lighter. Whether it's got any color associated with it is very idiosyncratic. Some people report maybe some light yellow or some tan or something like that in some of the jhanas, but it, it, there's no, I mean, it's, it's idiosyncratic. Most people, it's just dark when, you're, when they're in the jhanas. It's only when you get super concentrated, maybe it would be bright and white. I wasn't struck by the visual field until I hit the fourth jhana but it probably was lighter than normal. It just wasn't striking. I'm really curious as to um, when you were doing the experiments and they were telling you to go previous or next, um, what happened? What what they found? <laughs> yeah. So I've meditated for science a number of times, uh, both EEG and fMRI. There, there's actually a picture of my brain on second jhana. Okay, it's a difference map between what my brain is like when I'm not doing anything at rest and when I'm in second jhana, and you can see that some places there was more activity, but a lot of places there was less activity. The parts of the brain associated with generating a sense of self had quieted down. The prefrontal cortex there uh, is associated with emotions. More activity on the right is negative emotions. More activity on the left is positive emotions. And you can see that there's more activity on the left, which is what you would expect with PT and Sukha. Happiness, joy, rapture. Okay, so clearly in second jhana, and it, it turns out, because I've seen pictures of all of them, in all four jhanas, there's more activity in the left prefrontal cortex than the right. Even in the fourth jhana, which is subjectively neutral, we're still experiencing it as a neuroscientifically positive emotion. Also in the center of the brain is the nucleus accumbens, the reward center. And uh, they told me in second jhana, my nucleus accumbens was on overdrive, right? It was pumping out rewarding neurotransmitters, basically. And that's the nucleus accumbens, yeah, is implicated in dopamine and opioids. I think the dopamine is breaking down into norepinephrine and we experience it as PT. And the opioids like serotonin, that's the source of our sukha. Interestingly enough, I was at the forest refuge and was meditating in the meditation hall and my knee started really bothering me. I mean, it was really quite painful. And I thought, okay, if I can get to the second jhana, I should be able to generate some opioids and the knee pain should be reduced. So I didn't move or anything. And I was able to get to the second jhana and hang out there for a while. Now, did the pain go down? Yes. Did it go down because I was concentrated on something else or did it really go down? Well, when they rang the bell, 
the pain was still gone, right? It still had had the effect. So I obviously was somehow picked up some opioids, something in, in the jhanas was actually having a genuine pain relieving effect, which was, yeah, kind of nice. That's what they found. Activity in the second jhana, really strong uh, with the nucleus accumbens. Uh, still there in the third, quieter in the fourth, but still there. And uh, first jhana, they didn't get a lot of information because the PT generates movement and the muscle tension of the PT would completely make the EEG readings useless. All you see is muscle tension. In the fMRI, I had to be really careful not to move my head. And so I, I couldn't let the PT really go because my head might move. So they did get some pictures, you know, mild PT in the first, but sometimes I just go straight into the second. So I wouldn't move my head. So basically what they're finding, the selfing got quieter. That's one of the things about coming out of fourth jhana. Your usual sense of self has been diminished. It's like, go sit in the corner. We'll get back to you later, right? And so now you're able to look at the world from a less egocentric perspective, right? You're, you're seeing the world as it is. Normally, when we look at the world, we're looking at it. Yeah, can I eat that? Will that eat me? Well, maybe we're a little more sophisticated, but it's about, is this something I want to get or is this something I got to push away? I am in the middle of all that, right? So by practicing the jhanas, the sense, the, the, the self is not being created in the same way. The self has been calmed. And now when you look at the world, you're looking from a much more, a much less egocentric perspective and you got a much better chance of seeing what's going on. So yeah, this is what they found. The, uh, one other thing interesting about that. One time I went to do some EEG work and the guys wanted to see, they weren't that interested in the jhanas, but they wanted to see, could they generate a biofeedback EEG setup for detecting access concentration. Okay, and they'd wired up the machine to actually look at the nucleus accumbens. And they tested it out on themselves. And most people, when there's nothing going on, there's a reading of five for the alpha, alpha waves coming out of the nucleus accumbens. And so we talked about it and I said, okay, what you need to do is make it so that if there's muscle tension, which will mess up the EEG readings, make it beep in my ear and set it, you know, they said baseline was five. I said, set it to 10 and see if when I get to access concentration, did I pump it up, the reward center up to 10. So they wired me up and we turned it on. I start meditating and it's not beeping. I mean, it should be beeping, but I'm already at 10. I'm not doing anything. I'm just, I'm just sitting there. My default state is twice as rewarding as the average person's default state. Now, whether this is a result of all the years of jhana practice or the fact that I had a happy childhood or a combination of both, who knows? So they had to, they had to change it so it would stop beeping at 20. All right, so now sit there, it's beeping. I get into access, it's still beeping. First jhana, yeah, it's beeping because of all the muscle tension. I get to second jhana, it's quiet. I pumped it all the way up to 30, it turned out. I moved to third jhana, it comes back on. I'm at 18, right, just below the threshold, but definitely above rest. You go to fourth jhana, it's 12, it's still beeping. I go back to third jhana, it's beeping. I go back to second, stops beeping. I intentionally distract myself. Okay, I start thinking about something else, get a fantasy going, it starts beeping. You know, I go back into second jhana, beeping goes away. I drop back into access, the beeping comes back. Back to rest, it's still beeping. It was like they invented a second 
jhana detector rather than an access concentration detector. So we talked about it a bit, you know, what, so they decided they would look here and look for delta, a decrease in delta. I don't remember any of the numbers for that. So they rewired the machine and uh, put the electrodes there. And we did the same thing again. And uh, they were able to detect when I got to access concentration, the delta dropped enough so it stopped beeping. And second, third, fourth, uh, third, second, and back to access, it didn't start beeping again. I'm in access, I intentionally distract myself, it starts beeping, I come back into access, it stops beeping. So yeah, they were able to see things, a decrease in Delta here, which would be an indication of decreasing in selfing and an increase in the nucleus accumbens and more activity in the left prefrontal cortex and less activity back in the back where you do generation of self. In order to get in the number of hours a day of practice that you recommend, say on retreat, you sit like six, eight hours. And then after we get home once in the morning, once at night an hour, it seems like you have to practice at night. And that may not be a good idea for me to generate a whole bunch of PT before I go to bed. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure how to navigate that. I've actually heard of some people say that they jumped right to the fourth jhana or something like that. I don't anticipate that happening to me, but um, what do you do? Yeah, so it may be you just don't do jhana practice in the evening. You do some mm -hmm. other practice. You do the body scan or, or some metta, or so, the body scan and some metta, or something like that. It is possible once you learn the jhanas quite well and are good at generating deep access to bypass the first jhana and just go straight into two, which has got mild PT, or maybe even straight into three or four and just mm -hmm. bypass the PT completely. Uh, you would want to practice that on retreat rather than go home and attempt to do that sure, sure. so that you don't make the mistake of winding up in the first when you didn't really mean to. But it is possible to do that. It's not easy. I mean, you can start your car in fourth gear, right? It's hard. It's kind of tricky. But if you're on a downhill slope, yeah, you could start your car in fourth gear. It wouldn't be that hard. Well, the downhill slope with the jhanas is how deep is your concentration? If your concentration is deep enough, you can just drop right into four. If it's deep enough, you should be able to drop into any of the eight jhanas, provided you know them well enough. That's so, what it means to be a master of the jhanas, actually. Sure. So when we practice in the evening, you recommend we still practice in the evening, but just do the Vipassana or something, basic, yeah. something that's not jhanas. Right. If, if you find that the PT is problematic in the evening, then yeah, don't do the PT in the evening. Do something else, definitely. Well, I guess, what's your experience? Uh, when... You have PT and it keeps you from sleeping. Do you really feel like the next day, like you have a, you, you, you needed more sleep or is it that you really don't need as much? Most people who have PT that gives them insomnia definitely feel more tired the next day. You just didn't get enough sleep. On jhana retreats, people often say to me, you know, usually I go on a retreat, I don't need so much sleep, but on your retreats, I seem to need more. And I'm like, yeah, you're working really hard. Sitting there doing nothing, your brain is using 25% of your energy. Okay. <laughs> Sitting there doing nothing and working really hard at meditation, your brain's probably using half your or three quarters of your energy at that point. So yeah, you're definitely burning calories. You're definitely using a lot of energy to do this practice. And yeah, you need, you need your sleep. And so if it keeps you awake, I mean, if it only keeps you awake for an hour, maybe it's not so bad, but if it keeps you awake for two or three hours, yeah, it's a problem. Sorry.
Yeah, this is a general statement. I mean, you can feel free to experiment and see if it works different for you. But as a general statement, yeah. When people get the PT going too much in the evening, it does tend to steal more than an hour. It steals a couple, three hours or even more. And they do feel tired the next day. But maybe it's different from you. And I don't have any problem running PT in the evening. I can run the PT and I'll go to sleep pretty quickly. Just, you know, it's not a problem. But then I'm one of those people that slept okay on Indian trains. So, you know, <laughs> I'm really lucky that sleep comes easily to me. You know, I have insomnia once or twice a year, but you know, otherwise it's pretty good. Okay, it's getting a bit late. We're not even gonna take a break. I'm gonna do a quick meta. So, in order to begin, please put your attention on your breath for a few moments. So, do you like to be happy? I mean, when you're happy, is that a good thing? You like being happy? I mean, yeah, when you're happy, it, that's nice. Can you get in touch with the fact that you like being happy? That you appreciate your life when you're happy? It's nice when you're happy. You like it when your friends are happy? I mean, that's, that's good. When my friends are happy, yeah, that makes me happy. Yes, I can really enjoy their happiness. It's nice when my friends are happy. I really, really like that. What about your acquaintances? What if your neighbors are happy or your coworkers? Or if you go into a store and everybody in the store is happy? That's pretty good. Makes interacting with people a lot nicer if they're happy. It's a good thing when people are happy. What if the difficult people in your life were happy? Not happy because of some horrible thing they did, but they were to find happiness with a wholesome activity. Now that'd be good. If they were doing wholesome stuff, then they wouldn't be so difficult. If they could find wholesome happiness, yeah, that'd be a definite improvement. Even the difficult people, yeah, that'd be good if they've got some wholesome happiness. What if everybody on this planet was happy? Wow, wouldn't that be a really great world? I mean, everybody you run into everywhere, they're happy, you're happy. You know, everybody's happy. Think about it, a world totally filled with happy people. That'd be really nice. May all beings everywhere be happy. <laughs> 